Thank you very much, and um, it's it's been a while getting to this point. Uh, you'll kind of see as we talk about our plan, we've had some different iterations, different mindsets in terms of the development of the plan itself. Uh, but I'd like to go through that with you this evening, if I could. Um, make mention that uh, it's been referred to, there was a 17-member committee. You see uh, not the names of the individuals, but you see uh, the list of who was represented around the table. We tried to do that in a way that uh, various groups were represented. I can't say that I, you know, a committee is hard uh, to organize from the beginning to make sure that you have them all, but yet they are able to work as a team. Uh, sometimes they can get so large uh, that you can't accomplish the task before you. But I also mentioned to you that uh, what you see here or what we have used is our authoritative sources for guidance and information. Every meeting that we held uh, started out with uh, a health update uh, so that we were keeping our eye on the ball in terms of why we're doing this. Uh, it starts with why and uh, we, we know why we're, we were tasked and uh, continue to monitor that situation. But as you see there, the guidance that we follow comes from the uh, United States Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, uh, Kentucky Department of Edu Education, KDE, uh, their Healthy at School requirements. And they really are requirements. I think they may be termed as guidelines, but uh, based upon uh, deviations that I've heard with other school districts with that, uh, they have uh, said that these are requirements that you have to adhere to uh, to continue to consider in-person schooling. And then also the Grand River District Health Department, Mr. Clay Horton, who's the director there. Uh, we've had numerous conversations or calls, meetings with him. Uh, as a part of us, there's a letter that will be referenced in our uh, reopening plan itself where he has reviewed it uh, and uh, placed his endorsement upon the plan that we have, adopt, uh, have adopted and bring to you. Also, uh, Owensboro Health uh, has been involved in reviewing our plan. Uh, Dr. Dufresne has reviewed our plan and finds it to be in compliance with health uh, guidelines. And then also we had a, a pediatrician, local pediatrician, that served on our uh, task force, Dr. Courtney Cruz, who was very instrumental to us in terms of uh, getting feedback uh, as it pertains to this virus and uh, how it interacts with children as well as adults. So <clears throat> that was extremely important to us. I want to give you an idea about where uh, that information uh, that we sorted through would come from. So uh, our original plan, uh, really at the end of June, 1st of July, uh, consisted of all students uh, and that's estimated at 9,600. Well, that's not our total student population. And the reason for that is based on our survey results, and you'll see a slide that shows this momentarily, uh, roughly 20% of our students uh, we're estimating at this point in time uh, that would choose a virtual option. That may be higher uh, in the end, but that's where we were at our last survey point. Um, then uh, approximately 2,000 staff members. Uh, so the plan was for them to return on Wednesday, August the 26th. So in total, uh, we're talking almost 12,000 people that we're trying to manage in person for. And that, was, that would be five day in person classes, uh, always with the idea that there would be a virtual academy option available. We, we had to do that, we knew that early on, simply because there were a number of students with uh, adverse health consequences and we have staff with adverse health consequences that in the environment by which we would have to operate would, uh, would be excluded. So the idea would be, and remains, is that with the students who are part of the uh, virtual academy that they would be matched with teachers who have elected to teach virtually. Uh, now there will be an eventual day of reckoning with that where we'll try to reconcile those two and invariably we'll have some adjustments there to make to, to make that happen. All right, so as I mentioned, up until really about the 4th of July, maybe even uh, days that followed that, we were operating on that path. Uh, then we began to see uh, changes in terms of increased cases. And you'll see a graphic that shows this from the Green River District Health Department uh, in the community spread that we have here. 
uh, all the while with the safety of our students and staff is the number one priority. Uh, frankly, it was sort of an epiphany for me that uh, you know you, you can some, somewhat be charging up the hill uh, with the idea of this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do, we're going to make it happen. And uh, it was important for us to make sure we circle back to say, why are we doing this to start with? And then I would say, as we began to plan for uh, the reopening of schools, uh, we encountered significant logistical problems, uh, some of which, to meet the guidelines, are almost insurmountable. So uh, we began to look at this as more of a re-entry plan instead of a reopening plan. Uh, it may seem a little bit semantical, but there, there are differences in terms of re-entry uh, of what we will talk to you about as we progress. So this graphic shows you from the Green River District Health Department. It's a weekly graph, and we found that the weekly graph is, is a better gauge of looking at cases. You can have one-day spikes. Uh, maybe a, a one day could be representative of two or three days accumulation. And so when you look at it over a week, it sort of spreads that out and averages it to what looks to be a little more meaningful number to examine. And so you see the most recent two weeks up through uh, Monday of this week uh, represented on that graph. So those are the last 14 days uh, with cases in the Green River District area and they're representative of pretty large increases uh, in our area. Naturally, the Kentucky positive rate uh, mimics that. Uh, statewide, so it's a little bit different, uh, but you see what's happening uh, with that graphic and that uh, is as current as we could find that would be available for us to view. And of course, this is the United States graph. Uh, you, know, and for, you know, we live in a, a free and country with liberty to travel and move about, so it still is relevant. We know that a lot of individuals have gone on vacation. We've had holiday, uh, and so there's uh, a lot of interaction. Uh, between states, and so it's still it's still relevant to watch what's going on across the country, and you can see that upward climb there consistently. Of course, we know that uh, some of the most hard hit states, Texas, Florida, Arizona, uh, Georgia, uh, some of uh, even Tennessee now, um, is represented in, in large numbers of increased cases on a national basis. So moving back to our parent and staff surveys, just a big picture. Uh, we received responses from, from 1,339 of our 2,000 staff members. I think it's about uh, two-thirds, a little bit above that perhaps. And then uh, we received responses from 4,400 parents. Uh, when we look at, at the number of students, because we asked them to uh, provide for us their age, uh, grade level of their students, as well as the school location of their students, that represented about 70%. Uh, of our students by way of parent uh, responses. And approximately 20%, as I mentioned a few minutes earlier, uh, parents indicated an interest in the uh, virtual academy for their children. 80% uh, is, is the numbers that we're using right now, uh, parent interest in, in person, which is about the 9600 number. Then we asked a question in the survey, do you plan to send your child to school when DCPS opens for in-person classes on August 26th. And this is where we've, we've gotten to the 80-20. If you look at the red, that's about 10%. It's not marked on that graph, but that is about the 10 percentile. 56.5% said without question they wanted in-person. And then we had 26.3% that were undecided. And simply to get to the 80-20, we, we split that difference. So in the end, uh, it may look a whole lot differently from this uh, once we ask parents to uh, make a formal uh, decision as to what they plan to do with their children uh, for the 2020-21 school year. Board, I want to mention that you do have a copy, or we will provide a copy to you, okay? Meant to do that on the start, and sorry I skipped that. Um, so that way you do have a copy of the slides. If you want to go back to look at them, you can, you can refer back to it. So I didn't need to be taking notes. <laughs> Well, you still need to take notes, Mr. Anderson. I think that's probably a demonstration of a good student. <laughs> and so uh, then this graphic uh, asked a question. We had a little bit of time issues here because when we, at the time we surveyed, uh, we were 
uh, very intent at that moment of uh, five-day instruction. But we did ask a question about uh, if local COVID-19 conditions worsened and DCBS had to discontinue daily in-person instruction for a time period, which of these traditional instructional options would be preferable for your family? And if you look at that, 46.2% uh, said attending school in person uh, every other day, <clears throat> which was the model that I guess was most prevalent at the time. The AB model uh, was 46.2%. 26.4% .2%, uh, said attending school in person or alternate on alternate weeks. Uh, and then the remaining uh, would be uh, out of classroom virtual learning. And so this visual that you have here is ultimately where we've landed as uh, the task force. And there's two models, but I want to explain the difference between the two. On the right-hand side, you have what I have been terming as the virtual academy. Uh, that would remain as it's standalone. The in-person has a, a stoplight visual that gives us different options based upon the conditions of the COVID-19, both in our area as well as statewide. So it starts with the red option as NTI, which is digital. Uh, we don't really like to use the, the acronym NTI because it has a bad memory of March to May of last year uh, when we had roughly about 48 hours to make that switch uh, to that model. We do see that as a a true digital model that would be improved greatly upon what we experienced uh, a year ago. The yellow light is the AB schedule, which is a hybrid schedule of in-person versus digital uh, hybrid learning. And then the five-day in-person, which is the green light, is based upon conditions that uh, we deem in the area based upon the guidance that I showed in the first slide gives us the indication that we can go five days. And so, uh, it, it is our recommendation as we move along through the uh, slideshow that we would begin school on the AB model, but we'll tell you a little bit more about that. And Jenna Beth is here to uh, go into much more detail with you on the instruction side of this as to what those models look like in a deeper dive. So let me first remind everyone that the virtual model is standalone. If a family selects virtual, they will remain on virtual regardless of what is happening with the health conditions and safety conditions that we are looking at. The other three models we are calling an integrated instructional design, and this will allow for us to change if we have all students in place, half our students with the AB model, or if we are going to a temporary digital model because of health and safety concerns. So if a family picks in person, in essence, they are selecting the three models you see with the stoplight colors. The all in-person model is when we feel it's safe enough to bring 100% of our students back, minus the virtual, so we're talking about the 80% that Matt shared with you earlier. Remember that we anticipate, even if we start to bring students back, teaching and learning in the day-to-day -day operation of school is going to look slightly different, just like tonight's board meeting looks slightly different. And so we want everyone to keep that in mind. What is new and takes the most explanation is the AB model. So the AB model is one of the alternative learning design models that is recommended by Kentucky Department of Education. They have sent out many documents that help school systems make the most uh, precise decisions for their families. As Matt shared with you, 46% of our parents surveyed preferred this model when we were sharing rotational models. Students would be assigned to either group A or group B, and this places the importance on in-person learning. And it uses what we call an integrated instructional design. And basically, an integrated instructional design is a tech-enabled design. And so it works with teachers to design lessons that work well if I am face-to-face, -face, but can quickly transition to a tech-enabled design if needed. And it allows us to use three different types of learning. And so those three different types are in-person, hybrid, and digital days. So what does the AB rotation look like for students? Students in Group A would start their week on Monday and Tuesday attending in person. And obviously we're going to maximize the in-person learning. We're going to do the activities that require a teacher to be there, 
we're going to engage the students. Our class sizes will be much smaller, which will allow for us to put in all the health and safety concerns because only half of the students selecting in person will be there. What will the Group B students be doing? They will be doing what we're calling hybrid days. And hybrid days are when students are reading and writing independently. They may watch videos that are recorded by their teachers, complete assignments either digitally on paper, and we're putting in place a phone and educator option so families and students can reach out and ask advice if they need help with an assignment. The intent in the hybrid days is that these are tech enabled, but if you know the term flipped classroom, this is flipping the classroom and thinking what can the teacher do independently. A great example I can give you is if we had a high school teacher who was introducing why did the United States join the, get into World War II, they may be giving a great lecture about Pearl Harbor and the impact that that had on the United States and our entrance into World War II. That lecture could be recorded and students could watch it independently on the hybrid days and then when they come for in-person days, they would do activities together, maybe have a debate about that and actually engage in a different type of learning. So that is what the groups do when they're not in person. On Wednesday, all groups have what we call digital day. And this is a day when all students participate in virtual learning opportunities. The classroom teachers and the school staff interact. We foresee there being school assemblies that are virtual. We see small groups of students getting together with a teacher. We see these digital days as being times when maybe a teacher picks up the phone and checks in on an individual student. There are lots of possibilities here. Our fine and performing arts teachers can see a lot of things they might do in a virtual world for this digital day. Teachers will still report to school, but this will allow us to make sure we get into the building and do a deep cleaning and actually between the two student groups. And so if you look closely, group A goes Monday and Tuesday, group B would go Thursday and Friday. Now remember in that continuum, we may swing to red. And red means we go to NTI or what we're calling a digital a virtual digital NTI experience. What changes for students? The only change that students will see is they won't get to come in person, but they're going to remain in their A, B groups. And the teachers then are just doing virtual instruction for half the students. I can give you the best example from my role today. This morning I started my morning by facilitating a statewide conference on assessment and I had 50 people. I cannot keep track of what the 50 people were doing virtually. And so I did the best I could. But if you were talking, I had to figure out who it was to mute you and that type of thing. This afternoon, a smaller subset, 13 of us, got together for a meeting and I facilitated that meeting. Because my group was reduced, I was able to actively engage. I had everyone's image up on the screen. And honestly, it was a phenomenal meeting. No one turned their cameras off, people paid attention, and I felt like our virtual meeting was as effective as our face-to-face. -face. And so if we keep in place the A-B rotation, even if we have to go to NTI, we will see improvement in that area. Now, just a reminder about what DCPS Virtual Academy will look like. The Virtual Academy, families make selections for the semester. We strongly recommend that you really consider if you have a K-1 or 2 student. As an educator and an elementary school teacher, it is challenging to think of our kindergarten, first, and second grade students participating in a virtual academy. We will do the best we can. We just want each family that's considering that to really think carefully about that. So much of the early reading skills require that you have a face-to-face -face interaction. Students will need support. And we know they'll need support from their home school. It might be Family Research Center or guidance. That will still be available. A DCPS teacher will be assigned for the K-8 world. So in kindergarten through eighth grade, we're pulling all those students together. Teachers will be assigned, as Matt mentioned earlier. We have settled on using Eureka Math, which is the math curriculum that all of our 11 of our 12 elementary schools use and one of our three middle schools. We are using Wit and Wisdom as the ELA, which is English Language Arts curriculum. This is a curriculum all three middle schools use and half of our elementary schools use. 
And the K-8 Science and Social Studies will be teacher-made with resources that we're looking for now. High school teachers may potentially have a hybrid course load. They may teach one virtual class and two in-person class. And in a few high school classes, we may have what we call limited synchronous opt-in. For those high school kids who are picking virtual that maybe have this unique class and they're one of the only people, we will consider having an opt-in version. And then we also have edgenuity. I want to stress that students and families selecting virtual academy, this is not a learn at your own pace type thing. They're not going to get assignments on Monday and by the following Monday have everything tuned, turned in. We anticipate that students will receive instruction online Monday through Friday from their teachers. There'll be a set schedule of teaching and they will see rigorous coursework. I also want to mention here that for our K through 8 students, they will get instruction in the four core areas. High school students will still be able to take credits. Those credits will match the number of credits that they would be able to obtain in their home high school. All right, so uh, moving back to uh, the recommendation for uh, in-person instruction via the AB schedule. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have a total of, again, what we're estimating, so our best guess of about 80% of our students wanting, wanting in-person <coughs> classes. So the AB schedule allows us to literally divide that in half. So roughly 40% of our students would come on Monday, Tuesday. The remaining 40% would come on Thursday, Friday, allowing us the deep cleaning day on Wednesday in between the two groups. So when you look at that numerically, uh, I think the, num the large numbers uh, become much more meaningful. <laughs> what that means is instead of 9,600 students uh, coming all at once, uh, that would be 4,800 students coming all at once. Uh, also allows us, us in the social distancing, which is a key component of the guidelines, to look at classrooms that would average between 12 to 15 versus classrooms that would be 24 to 30. Uh, when we began to look at square footage, we don't have the same exact square footage in each and every classroom. We don't even have the same exact square footage within the buildings. That's because of the different vintage of buildings that were, were constructed and based on KDE guidelines uh, in terms of how much square feet you know a classroom was determined to be uh, causes some variance uh, within uh, a school. Uh, Apollo High School, Burns Middle School, uh, certain Burns Elementary School, those would be common examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, masks are required when social distancing is not possible, which is the six feet. Uh, and so if we loaded all of our uh, classes fully, then that would require masks, uh, you know, virtually all day. So, excuse me, are you saying that if we do the, what you're recommending then, Possibly they won't have to wear a mask while they're learning. While they're That's correct. Classroom. If if so if we're able to properly social distance, and we think that we can using 12 to 15, use the 12 to 15, we we think that's achievable. Okay. Uh, you know, which is a big piece. Uh, I mean, we're all wearing masks in here, uh, and have had it on in different variations. And uh, I can say, as adults, uh, it's not comfortable uh, for very long periods of time. Uh, even our pediatrician attested to that, which I thought was pretty compelling. Uh, the masks are required for uh, the doctor's office for kids to wear, and she finds that you know very troublesome. Uh, I won't go into the full anecdote that she gave us on that, but she, she did uh, certainly comment on that. Certainly hand sanitizer stations are in every classroom. We've made that accommodation, and in all common areas uh, upon entry, in the cafeteria, in the gymnasium, uh, auditoriums, those areas, uh, office areas would have uh, hand sanitizer. And then we would have to modify our specials. Uh, the idea would be, uh, it doesn't work elementary to middle to high school, uh, but ideally the idea would be is any of our specials teachers such as art, music, uh, PE probably not so much because we need kids um, uh, uh, being involved with, with physical education. But to the extent possible, we would have those teachers travel to the classroom so we're mitigating the students traveling around the building. Uh, so the, the specials would have to be modified for those, those types of reasons. 
All right, looking at uh, further at, at the in-person instruction, the AB schedule, mask uh, would, be, would be required on the school bus. You'll hear from Grady Cooper here momentarily, who's the uh, manager in the transportation department. Uh, temperature checks will be done within 30 minutes of arrival. Uh, breakfast in the classroom is standard throughout uh, all 12 of our elementary schools. And then we would provide a grab and go breakfast for middle school and high school students to take with them uh, to their classroom. So this is uh, a graphic mimics what uh, Ms. Francis just showed you a few minutes ago that shows you, you know, how the schedule looks, but how does it look uh, in context with the reopening of schools in August 26. And we looked at several different things here as a recommendation. We looked at starting on Monday. Uh, that was challenging from the pacing standpoint of making sure that uh, our children's learning was paced properly. And so our idea with this, a, a, a general philosophy, is we want to be in front of our children. We want to be in front of our children five days a week, let me say that very boldly and emphatically. But we want to be in front of our ch children uh, safely when we can do that. And that's the key variable uh, that guides our, our recommendation to you. However, with that, we would have on Wednesday, August the 26th, would be in person uh, with the red group as shown. And then Thursday, Friday really starts the schedule for the B group. Uh, they, they would come Thursday and Friday while the uh, a group would, would then be in their hybrid learning model. And then uh, beginning Monday the following week, we're in, a, we're in our standard rotation. The only time we would deviate uh, from this, and it shows uh, the week of Labor Day week, since Monday would be a holiday, we would not be in school that day. Uh, we felt like we still needed the same number of days for in-person learning. And so the A group would be Tuesday and Wednesday. The B group would be Thursday and Friday. That's the only deviation that we would make because of the holiday. Uh, it, it, this is designed for us to be where we are at this point in time. Uh, what I said in the uh, guideline document that you have is that after roughly about two weeks, when we got experience uh, really doing school in a whole new way. Uh, many people don't uh, have the complete understanding, nor should they, uh, about the large logistics that go into managing school, managing children when they get to school at 6.45 a.m. because their parents need to go to work uh, on that particular day, uh, as well as breakfast uh, into within the classroom with social distancing. Uh, the, the lunch is all uh, has to be different and modified uh, back to classroom and then the dismissal at the end of the day all has to be different uh, for uh, in this case, 9,600 students. And we just found that there was extreme, we couldn't social distance in classrooms with all of our students there. And if you couple that with rising cases, uh, those two don't agree with one another. Uh, so that was, that really got at our practice and our thinking. Um, so now what, uh, next steps for parents and staff. Uh, once the board hears this, and let me mention this here publicly, uh, board tonight is designed for you to hear the plan. Uh, this is your, your first hearing of the consolidated complete presentation of the plan. I know you've been pro provided uh, a hard copy of this. Uh, you've had a chance to, to look at it and read through it. This is the first time you've had a chance to hear from us uh, what the plan entails and its, and its depth. Uh, so mention that once the board takes action on our plan, which would be scheduled for Monday, uh, a special call meeting Monday at 11.45 a.m. at Davis County High School. That will be an open opportunity uh, for anyone from the public who would like to attend that meeting and make comment. Uh, we'll, we will have that available in a safe manner uh, for that to occur. Uh, public comment uh, is available between now uh, through Monday via our email address at contact at dcps.org. Uh, that would be the best way to make sure that we hear from everyone. Uh, and whatever we have accumulated tonight uh, prior to the close of the meeting, I would like to make sure those uh, can get heard. Uh, next steps, the parent document once approved uh, and the staff document that has all the procedures in it because both 
sets of those uh, we will have to marry together and, and get down to uh, what those decisions are from those respective parties that would go out immediately and then uh, uh, within 24 48 hours we would send uh, the form that uh, allows parents to make their decision mr. Anderson so is this document open to the public it will be it will be yes I mean it it's uh, it's in a stage right now where it's draft form until the board takes action to approve that uh, or, or not approve it. Or if somebody wanted to copy this between now and Monday, can they get a copy of this? Well, uh, in terms of the PowerPoint presentation, yes. Right. Yes, that will be made available. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Well, Certainly go. the back end of the meeting that's got the presentation, I'm not sure people uh, may be so interested in our business portion of the meeting, but the back end of the meeting that has the entire presentation will be made available for anyone that wants it and it's the PowerPoint there's by de facto will be available very good all right so the family decision uh, document uh, that will be sent to families uh, as our expectation would be at or around July 29th families will review uh, parent family information document to learn about in-person instruction and virtual Academy options and then we'll want parents to uh, to make their choice by August the 3rd I'll tell you that that really starts the beginning of a lot of work <coughs> on our end to make sure that we're dividing uh, properly into groups staffing uh, is a critical function for us uh, we do anticipate that there there are going to be some issues in making sure that we're properly staffed uh, for both virtual and in-person options but we'll need to do that uh, as quickly as possible Anybody that selects the virtual academy, you see, that is for the entire semester. Then. For for the for middle and high school students, uh, that's what the plan calls for. Is that once uh, a parent makes an election to go to the, the virtual academy, that will be for the first semester. For elementary students, that'll be through nine weeks, and uh, they'll then have an opportunity. Lots of reasons for that. Uh, at the middle and high school level, there's a difference between pacing even within the same course uh, and so you know it gets pretty difficult to take a kid that's in one level of pacing and then move them back to a, a virtual option uh, and then the, at the elementary that we felt like at the end of the nine weeks that's that's an established grading period uh, for them the difficulty is uh, allowing re-entry of students can depending on the numbers significantly change you know logistical issues that we might have we will try to make as much accommodation for that as possible but that's what we're uh, we're thinking as the best guidelines for that now the a b schedule if we started that way and the numbers improved you know, dramatically over a short period of time we would we would switch it to the five-day situation absolutely so yeah, the question would be is uh, if we see uh, the environment as it pertains to the virus improving anywhere significantly in there we would switch what we're saying is at the end of two weeks uh, we're going to be watching it every day uh, I'll assure you that uh, the stoplight gives us the ability to toggle uh, up or down uh, because we're, we're chasing the virus it's not chasing us and so the, the philosophy is, is we need to make sure we're responsive reactive to that on a very rapid pace and obviously as far as uh, once we get the students trained as far as using masks and that type of thing that will be an easier issue down the road as well obviously. absolutely I mean the hope would be is once we get the experience because we're gonna have to get some experience with having students we've we've not uh, had any chance at doing that we drill for earthquakes fires uh, active shooter uh, lockdown drills uh, all those kinds of things we drill for with students we've never had the chance to to practice some of these things and to teach what we're going to have to teach kids to do uh, social distancing uh, you know I've, I've observed uh, watching students watching kids uh, not so much in the student realm at that point but uh, that's that's a difficult challenge as you might imagine we have uh, Wendy Cozell with us Wendy's our school health coordinator and she's also a member of the task force and I'd like for her to drill in closer to the health and safety aspect. Wendy? All right. 
Right. Um, one of the things that the CDC has always recommended, and they have told us, is, is that the key to slowing the spread of, spread of COVID-19 is in practicing social distancing. And so, as a member of the task force and as well as a nurse and someone who is advising on that health piece of it, that was the biggest challenge I think that we face as we're putting these plans into place in the school was to make sure that we did have, um, could provide our students and staff with the appropriate social distancing. Um, right now, um, what we're having to do in each of our school health rooms is evaluate what is currently uh, <coughs> available to us and determine if there's an adjacent space for isolation. What is calling for us when we see children, whereas before, teachers were able to send us kids um, that were not feeling well, had been injured, um, required some sort of medication or treatment, just at either a specified time or at whim. Okay, so what we have to look at now is we can't have a congregation area for children, especially who are exhibiting any sort of signs and symptoms of COVID, to be gathered together. And so we are charged with having a space that is available for our children who are not having any ill symptoms, but just simply need their routine medication, their treatments, or other health procedures. Then we have to have a space where we can actually assess children who may be exhibiting some symptoms, okay, and staff, and that has to be done privately. And then we have to have a space that once we determine that student needs to go home based on their symptoms, we have to have a space for them to be isolated, um, um, you know, from being around other students while they're waiting for that parent to come home. And so this is something that we're working very closely with each building administrator to find those appropriate spaces and also to find the appropriate staff who are gonna be able to monitor those children, take care of those children safely. So that was the first thing that we, um, that we are having to do. And one of the biggest considerations with those spaces are, are they accessible or do we have windows? A lot of our health rooms may be in the interior of a building where we don't have any windows. Ventilation helps, fresh air helps. It helps to lose that virus if it is in the air. Um, you know, an outside door is preferable or at least close to the door so that if there's a child who is um, very symptomatic, we're not parading them past a lot of other classes or other students to, to potentially um, expose them. And of course, those health rooms or those facilities still have to have um, you know, computer, phone access, internet, um, hand washing facilities, and restrooms if possible. So finding those particular things has, you know, could be a challenge, but it's something that we're brainstorming with, and I feel very confident we'll be able to find appropriate spots for all of those needs. Um, we do have to send ill staff home immediately with administrative support and also isolate students if they're not there to immediately take them home. So that's um, something that we have to make sure we're able to do. We're, we're working with um, different, like with Steve Burton, he's gonna help us hopefully develop a virtual waiting room so that teachers are able to put those students having symptoms in that virtual waiting room and we can call for them as we have space available and kind of use those triage skills to try to get our most um, symptomatic kids seen first. We're working um, to post signs throughout the school facility promoting proper hand washing, respiratory hygiene. It's also um, a big part of that is providing some training before the kids come to school, like with proper hand washing. Yeah, uh, excuse mm -hmm. me. But if we went 100% of the kids, would we have room to do the virtual waiting rooms and those kind of things? I think it's going to be difficult to handle half the kids, even with the amount that we're going to see. So the virtual, that's basically using a computer space where they can sign, sign kids in, which is similar to what we're doing outside in the community, like in different clinics. You know, people are calling in to get in line and we're doing a lot of triage over the phone. So I think most areas are having to come with a different way. You know, people are waiting in their cars instead of coming into a waiting room. So that's kind of consistent with what's going on in the community with right now as well. Okay. We'll pose this uh -huh. question here, but with the uh, all of the symptoms that uh, we're screening for, uh, pre-screening as well as screening uh, in school, uh, you can rattle those off better than I, could, I can, but just talk about the difficulty with that as it merges with other illnesses, because COVID-19 is not the only illness 
No, and what they have specifically said for us as exclusion um, risk factors, it would be a fever above 100.4 and or a cough and or vomiting and diarrhea and or an unusual rash. So those are very specific, but they also expect us to screen for other common symptoms, which would be a headache, sore throat, runny nose, um, you know, everything that is pretty much can be the flu, it could be strep throat, it could be allergies, it could be sinus infections, um, it could be an asthma exacerbation. So that is very difficult for us to screen and to differentiate between the two and unfortunately we're not able to do that. We can't diagnose, we don't have a magic wand um, to see which kids may be exhibiting symptoms because of that. So what's the, what's the protocol then if, I'm, if, if the student is exhibiting those symptoms, what happens? So if they come in and they're exhibiting um, any, especially one of the four that was listed, so they come in and they have a fever of 101. So we have to immediately get them in the isolation area. We have to contact the parent or guardian. We're actually going to be working with that parent, referring them to their primary care, okay? That child, once they're sent home, um, they have to be symptom-free right now for 10 days with 72 hours of that being without fever, um, you know, above 100.4. And so if they go see their primary care provider and they find out that the reason they, were, they had a fever is because they had an ear infection or because they had a UTI or there is another um, reason why that child was running a fever, then they would be permitted to come back to school before that 10 days based on that primary care provider's recommendation. So, um, you know, there's lots of ways. If they chose to be tested, um, then you're looking at, let's say they get a negative result. You know, right now from the guidelines from the health department, that doesn't mean an immediate return because those children could still continue to, to convert to positive. So they have to be symptom-free and fever-free for 72 hours before they can come back. Wendy, mm -hmm. this sounds like a whole bunch. It is. It's, it, I guess my question would be, it'd be really nice if none of this happens. But in the event it does, do we have enough staffing to adequately take care of what you just have rattled, I don't mean rattled off, right, but, but, yeah. but have shared with us? Do we have enough staff for that? Well, we are working with our with everyone in the building. So we're going to have to probably pull from other resources and other job descriptions in that building. I do not have enough health room staff, per se, to cover three separate areas of every school. And, um, you know, we can pull from different assistants and that, that's going to be, you know, our job is to train people in these. One of the things that the state has recommended we do is come up with a flow chart that will show teachers exactly when they're supposed to put that child in the virtual waiting room and then in the health room or one of those screening areas, it's going to tell that person working in it exactly what they need to do as far as exclusion and calling the parent referrals. Um, so, you know, that's something that the nurses are going to have to work on because there's not always a nurse present 100% at each school building right now. So some of our nurses may cover three buildings. So um, I see our nursing, our RNs, you know, having to do a lot with the ill screening and also the case management and working with parents and working with um, the school staff as far as referrals and trying to help get kids back and get the care that they need. So I don't know what this is going to look like right now. I don't know the kids, um, you know, they haven't been together. They haven't been together in school for a while. We don't see, I work at a clinic outside of school, PRN, and we're not seeing a lot of sick, sick people other than people who are being tested for COVID right now. But that will change when people are brought together. You know, that's just the nature of the beast. And so that is going to be very difficult as we get into flu season, as we get into just the normal ebb and flow of what when that starts to go around. The good thing is, is that if they, if they leave with those symptoms and it's the flu, that can be easily, easily diagnosed as well. And, but it's going to take that differential, and that's something that we're not able to do in the school building. So, um, you know, as you get into contact tracing, if you do have a positive, that's a whole other story. You know, what they're looking for is if you have a teacher or a student who tests positive for COVID-19, 
then the people who are within six feet of that person for longer than 15 minutes cumulative um, each day would be considered a contact. And those people actually have to stay out for 14 days. So they are, they remain quarantined at that point. So, you know, we're, we're really stressing um, assigned seats, you know, uh, ways that we can track those kids and we know exactly where they're at. We know who they've been exposed to. So that with that contact tracing is going to be a little bit easier for the health department to do. We're always here just a, a story with you that I always think it's relevant when it happens here. Uh, so uh, roughly a week ago, you know, we're, we're doing athletics right now and we've, we've done as much as we've been allowed to do when we're allowed to do it. Uh, we've been very aggressive about that, but safe. Uh, but we had, a, we had a young person that tested positive was asymptomatic uh, and as a result of that we had to uh, quarantine uh, 21 people. Uh, young people uh, do things in the evenings, they do things on the weekends and they have other contacts outside of school and that's exactly kind of what was had transpired in this particular case. Uh, but he was asymptomatic and he chose to get a test really on his own uh, without prompting just I think it was a family decision. Uh, to do that, but there was nothing that prompted it. it leads you to wonder, you know, how many asymptomatic, uh, you know, children, kids, adults, whatever you might throw into that, are out there, and uh, you know, what's that real spread look like? And then the, the, the big piece about that is how do they transmit it? How effective are they? You know, saw something here in the last uh, 24 hours that says uh, children 10 and over transmit at the same rate as adults. So I, just a lot of unknowns uh, about that. But going back to our, our, our young person here who tested positive, I quickly uh, moved this to August 26. And if we were in school, uh, posing that in-school scenario, the student was riding a school bus with elementary, middle, high school kids on that bus uh, that's going to different locations. We could have you know, we would have a bad situation there. And then within the high school, because of the, the changing schedules, kids in the high school don't uh, rotate in a little cohort group, you know, from class to class. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way in the high school, and it's, it just can't work that way. And so literally without the ability to contact trace, which would be the case, it probably would shut down an entire high school because of our inability to contact trace in that situation, it would be very, very difficult or challenging. So I want to mention that because that actually happened here about a week ago. Um, and we do, um, we do work very closely right now with our health department. There's probably not a day goes by I'm not emailing them for questions or getting guidance and they are have been wonderful working with us, but they are, uh, you know, that is someone we will be working very, very closely with as we are back in school and if we have positives start coming up so that we are giving them correct and, and accurate information as far as who exactly that student or staff member may have been exposed to. So unfortunately there is a potential for repeated quarantine depending on how it moves through and um, you know who how that exposure is and I think that is a huge concern is you know either staff having to constantly go down into quarantine or or other students and that's why it's so important for that social distancing piece because that is it's, it's really when you look at it if, if both parties are within six feet and they have mask on I mean that's great that would probably move it to more of a less risk or less potential for um, contracting the, the virus but it doesn't really do anything as far as them having to quarantine themselves if that makes any sense so yes they're not willing to say, well, if they have mask on, then you don't have to count them. They're not willing to say that because of the fact that people don't always wear their mask correctly, okay, or consistently. And that's something that they're not going to err on the side of, you know, they're going to err on the side of caution when it comes to potentially keeping other people from being exposed. So, um, and that's part of that exposure control plan that they've helped us. I mean, we're basically following their recommendations. If they say, you know, based on CDC and the health department can tell us this is when we need to exclude a student for how many days, I mean, that's what we're going to be going by. So that's, that may change as, as they find out more about it and as the standards change. And so we're very flexible 
and we will be implementing whatever that guidance is at the time. So um, it is very fluid. Wendy, I see the cafeteria seating charts. So our kids will be in the cafeteria? I think if they can socially distance in the cafeteria, that is the plan. For and lunch, to spread for lunch spread yes, it. to spread it out. I think they're looking at, and Lisa can talk about more after me, you know, and give, yeah, okay. she, she'll let you know more about that. Um, one of the things that we're going to have to do as well is we have to update all of our current individual health care plans for students <coughs> to reflect the public health situation. Um, and that has to do with our students with some chronic health conditions. I pulled some numbers just to give you an idea. Um, we have um, approximately 38 students last year. Now we haven't, they haven't rolled over to see which ones graduate and as new students come in. But 38 of our students had type 1 diabetes, which is a, a, an increased risk factor that we are going to have to address in an individual health care plan. Um, our students with asthma, we have over 1,000 right now who are marked with them throughout our district as having asthma, and that actually is another um, chronic illness that they could be impacted more severely if they were to um, develop COVID. So those are just uh, some small numbers of what we're going to have to be looking at as far as updating care plans. We have to have specific um, processes in place for managing students with asthma. One, there is a flow sheet that has been given down as far as helping us distinguish between as asthma symptoms and COVID symptoms, but unfortunately, if they're having an asthma attack, that would preclude a lot of, of them being exposed. So we are going to have to probably, you know, seek medical care for those kiddos as well. Using an inhaler, they should have a spacer. We are trying to discourage students from bringing in nebulizer treatments because of the nature of the aerosolization. They're really discouraging that. You can only have one person administering and the person itself in a room together, and then you have to have thorough cleaning afterwards. The person administering that nebulizer treatment has to be in full PPE, and it does increase their risk as well. So that is going to be a very big um, thing on our plate that the nurses are going to have to work with families to make sure that they understand that and they understand their risk and they speak with their health care provider and make sure that um, attending school is an appropriate thing depending on how severe their asthma is. Uh, medical waivers from a health care provider will be addressed either in an individual health care plan or a 504 plan that may already be in existence or an IEP in order for a student to be exempt from wearing a mask. So a parent cannot just write a note. Um, they can bring a note from the doctor, but that has to be part of a larger process. So that's going to require us sitting down with that family, sitting down with the staff at the school and coming up with a, a plan. If they're not going to wear a mask, we have to know where we're going to put them in the classroom and what exactly their risks are. Um, and that does require from, you know, a primary care provider to be able to provide that for them. And we will be doing the training on teachers, on the administration of the flow chart, how to properly take a temperature, and how to use PPE. So, you know, that's going to be really important that everyone knows exactly how to protect themselves and what are the minimum requirements based on your level of exposure and what you're doing for those students. Wendy, I do have one question. Sure. Uh, communication level. Let's, let's say you, you mentioned students being quarantined. Mm -hmm. Like, will the bus driver be notified that that's, you know, when that's, that, that, that you mean makes his rounds in the morning or whatever? That well, here, here's the thing about that. So. If we put, so if we have a student on a quarantine, if they show up at that bus stop, our bus drivers have to take them, and they'll talk with you about that. So, um, you know, they very well could make it into our building, and at that point we would have to address it. But that, that's a very r real risk that we're going to be faced with, is that enforcement piece of it. You know, going back to the numbers, one of the things that uh, I probably ought to wait on the transportation side, but it's relevant since the questions come up, but... At the, at the very beginning, when guidelines started coming to us, uh, the idea was that we had to socially distance on the school buses. I don't know if you heard about that or it may have gotten stamped before it got to you, but uh, the idea was is that maybe you would uh, be able to get 12 to 15 students on a bus, and I may be aggressive about that because of the social distancing. Well, uh, the superintendents quickly said that, that we can't have school then, is what you're telling us. You're shutting us down because we don't, no one has the capacity nor the bus drivers to even think about uh, some kind of a system like that. So they, they did go and transfer to a model where uh, as long as masks were worn uh, and the buses were ventilated with windows down, hand sanitizer, that you could 
uh, proceed on with transporting all children, you know, needing uh, access to a school bus. Still, what I tell you is it's not a great environment. It's, it's probably our toughest environment, uh, without question, because it's, it's an encapsulated, uh, you know, vehicle, uh, small space that's moving up and down the road. And so looking at our numbers, going back to 9,600, uh, starting day one with that was very fraught with uh, issues. And so moving to the AB schedule that we're talking about, reducing that by 50% uh, helps us to get start with anyway. And that's what we're talking about is the re-entry here, not a permanent reopening, okay? This is not a permanent plan, and it can't be because the situation requires us to be dynamic to it. But it does give us a better chance to reduce the numbers on the school bus from the infancy of the start uh, to gain experience again with that and how that's going to work without maybe having a, you know, a bad situation on our hands. What about, uh, what about privacy? What are, as far as students and, and our staff as well, if someone becomes positive, what's our requirement and what's our protocol for privacy? So how we handle any sort of student health condition, if it's a need to know basis within our district, it would never be um, like if we were sending out a letter to a parent group or all the parents of the classroom, it would just be there was a positive case. Okay, so we would be allowed to, obviously that bus driver would probably be one of the ones who were um, quarantined at that point. I know a lot of times when they even they contact Trace through the hospital through the health department, they say you were in direct contact, but they don't say who it was with. So hopefully, you know, that person's privacy is going to be maintained. If it's not maintained, it won't not will not come from our district if the the um, person is known. So that is that's just something that we do we are very cognizant of confidentiality, especially on the health side of it. And it would be even more important with something as sensitive as COVID-19 and, and perception in the community and with the family. So, you know, they will know, you know, we can't keep the fact that there was a positive case maybe in their classroom, but um, you don't know who it is. Unless they tell themselves and they do sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you, Wendy, very Thank much. You. Thank you for Thank all you. your work. Mm -hmm. I know you put into this. She's a, she has always been an incredible asset, but I don't know how to make that times 50,000, but that's okay. what she's been to us. She's just incredible about her job okay, and her experience, but then uh, I know that we've got tons of people that are hitting her with questions, and she is a, definitely a VIP for us right now, and we appreciate you, Wendy, well, thank you very much. and your dedication to the school district. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you all. Thank you. Ms. Sims. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. So we have made some plans and changed them along the way, but this is where we are now. And before you get started, I yes. just, just want to say, uh, I understand you're I'll let you announce it when you want to, but congratulations. On my, re on my retirement? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so young for that. <laughs> I just think my family needs me right now. There you go. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the first things that we uh, considered is uh, self-service. We do a lot of self-service in our kitchens, and we're, we're going to try to avoid that unless we have an item maybe that would not be touched by other people. You know, we have pre-wrapped apples and they're spaced out enough where they can grab one and not, not touch another, those type things. But we'll, we'll serve all adults and all students. I didn't think that was ever possible until a broader patch did it. What, the service? It, yeah, so there's no self-service. So, the, you know, you go and do it. You get on a salad you know. bar? Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> I've been there. Man, pretty good. Uh, we will use disposal trays and, and uh, silverware utensils, those type things, at first. Of course, our, our dish machines sanitize products just as well as a piece of plastic or, you know, styrofoam too. So we're not concerned about that, but I think it will help us get our um, best practice in, in order before we actually go to washing dishes. So we'll start off totally disposable. Um, floors will be marked every six feet to keep kids socially distanced while they're in line. We'll do our best to help regulate that. We're going to have two servers on every line, so we ought to be able to hopefully help control that somewhat there. Uh, cashier stations, they were going. To, it's all going to be touchless. So we've got we've ordered wands to wand the uh, barcodes. 
um, and you know the or the cashier will punch it actually punched in on the on her screen and we'll try not to change out cashiers and like you know sometimes one will do breakfast and one will do lunch we'll try not to do too much of that because of cross cross contamination and of course sanitize our stations and those things but um, that's going to be a totally touchless system so that'll be new um, then the time um, at meal time at breakfast time all elementary students will eat in the classroom for free and um, we're doing the breakfast in the classroom like we did at the other nine schools and now we'll do it at all 12 and we think that's better for contact tracing have kids in the classroom because they arrive at all different times in the morning in all different ways and uh, so in the high schools and middle schools we had to come up with something as well so we what we want to do for them is a grab and go so once there's supervision in the in the classrooms we'll start serving meals and they'll all have a choice they'll grab a bag of some sort and they'll take it to the classroom and and have their meals there that way we'll know who's sitting together we won't have to have to keep a roster of wherever they sit in the cafeteria if they were coming in in the morning it would be very difficult to track that um, adequate, adequate time is going to be given to the beginning and each end of each meal service to make sure they, they clean and sanitize their hands both coming and going from meal time um, this, the cafeteria oh on the days that um, the kids are at home they'll have they'll receive meals they'll be able to take home meals so on Monday Wednesday and Friday every school will hand out two well two sets of meals on Monday two sets of meals on Wednesday and one meal on Friday um, the breakfast and a lunch for all kids at home and we've got we work on those plans as well menus have been developed for that we've been working on them trying to make sure those menus at home kind of land line up with what they're doing in the cafeteria so that they they're not doing double work you know they're trying to combine items but um, the kids that actually eat in the cafeteria will, will receive mostly what we have planned year to year anyway we may cut out one or two items but it won't be but for the most part they'll all get choices like they used to Lisa on that previous screen mm -hmm. uh, who determines whether the uh, meals are free uh, well the breakfast in the classroom we've always done what's called provision two meals which based on the last full year service per percentages so the percentage of free reduced and paid are calculated based on your previous year's numbers so that's how we get our reimbursement when the numbers are high like for participation which breakfast and class is very very high then all of that kind of balances out as far as cost it's pretty much a break-even system unless some schools you know if they're too low in free reduce it might it might be difficult to absorb but we think it's going to be worth it this year for for the contact tracing okay thanks now as far as the middle and high schools we hope to get free meals to them from them too for both breakfast and lunch and free lunch for, for um, the elementary kids if the legislation goes through that's out right now they're trying to get that passed um, and it'll be just for the COVID season just for this time that if, if hopefully they'll do universal free meals for kids while all this is going on it would be really clean up and make things a lot simpler for us that'd, that'd and be a federal decision, wouldn't it? it will and the Senate, Senate has it right now this week they're voting on it eliminates you know more any money exchanges and all that but I know Lisa has been advocating with our U.S. Senators and U.S. Representatives on that front to try to see if we can make that happen so so um, the only kids that'll eat lunch in their classroom or the plan is right now is the free school they of course they don't have masks and so this is just gonna make it a little more difficult for them to to gather in a, in a community space so we're going to bring take the meal to them um, during all forms of meal service of course allergies will be considered as it always is we're used to kids eating in the classroom because of breakfast in the classroom in elementary schools so they're used to putting notes in those bags or putting an extra bag with somebody's name on it but they're always very aware of the allergies that are in each classroom so we feel like that will be fairly easy to address and during lunch they will need to sit at a sign table so that we can have contact tracing so those will be done by classroom and um, in the high school uh, they're going to have to be done by rooms I think and not class well be, it'd be classroom as well right and then if the tables or the students or both could be spread out to allow for the social distancing that's the recommendation um, 
it can be done one way or both. You know, probably a little of both would be the best. Lisa, just I know we've we've had one meeting together. Where we were talking about um, all the students. Obviously, this is sort of a a catalyst for us to think about some other options here. But if you could just kind of talk about what what it's going to look like when we have all students, all 80 percent instead of the 40 percent, 40 percent. Just you know, I know we didn't we didn't get too far down the road with that, but Talk a little bit about logistically what that would look like, other than what you're presenting to us. Well, the only, the only schedule I saw, I know there was an elementary schedule that was already completed before we, did, we went to the AB, and there was a middle school. And the middle school schedule I did look at and examine pretty closely. And in order to space them out where they thought they could space kids out properly, it was going to take, an, I think it was an hour extra to serve lunch. So, you know. It was gonna, we were going to have to stay an hour longer, basically, because it, you know, it's not like you could move breakfast time either. So it was just going to involve more time to serve kids. You know, it would take it off, you know, to 1 or one thirty even in some schools. So it, it can work. and We can make it happen. I mean, it's used multiple rooms in a big school, but, you know, we, we definitely will make it happen. We certainly were going to wind up with a lot more students eating lunch that is in their classrooms which uh, you know you start to kind of think about how much time is spent in a classroom uh, it's pretty large mm -hmm. you know at that point yeah we were talking about the kindergarten and preschool staying in the classroom just to get more have more space in the dining room and it is hard for kids not to not to leave the classroom at all you know for socializing and that's kind of their break time as well as their nourishment time any questions? More? Good task. Thank you very much. Yes. We, we just want to thank you for all the meals yeah. that have been served since yeah. March. You all have done a tremendous yeah. job. Thank you. Yeah. We'll keep on trucking on it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. All. Thank you. I'm going to talk about transportation a little bit. I know it's a hot spot, it's a hot topic, and the buses are hot this time of year. Uh, we are going to require the masks for all the students on the bus. We're also going to be requiring the masks for the drivers and monitors on the applicable buses for monitors. Uh, a face shield will be an optional thing in addition to the mask for the drivers that have that kind of contact with your special service kids, your preschool kids, and uh, hopefully not a lot of behavioral students, but those kids do need a little extra care in protecting the drivers is one of our main goals as well. Uh, the seating, they're going to be, we're going to be following the KDE guidelines and KDE's guidelines and recommendations for best practices are to seat them from the back of the bus towards the front of the bus, seating families together when we can. Uh, that will be, <clears throat> you're reducing the contact uh, of uh, who is in contact with the other people, the contact tracing. Uh, Kindergarten students, though, they are our students that need the most care and, and required to be a little closer to the driver for observation in case there's an emergency or something like that. We are going to seat them starting about the middle of the bus headed towards the front so they still get that front part of the bus and get that care that they need there, being able to be seen. Um, the assigned seating charts are going to be critical for the contact tracing. We're going to have two sets one for the A and one for the B part of the session. That's our plan right now. And we're also going to have riderships for double riderships. Now our routes are going to be basically, uh, we'll get to that later, I'll go ahead and talk to it. It's, uh, we're going to say that we're running our same routes, but we're picking up the A kids on this day, the B kids on this day. And that way we're going to ma maintain the consistency on pickup times, parent schedules, and they know what to expect from us. Um, the hand sanitizer as the children reach the bus, they're going to be given uh, about a dime size squirt of the hand sanitizer to rub in as they proceed back to their seats. Um, that's going to be in control. It's going to be a portable sanitizer. We looked at options of mounting it, but we couldn't find a good option on mounting and where and what's safe. 
so the driver or monitor will maintain control of that and then remove it as the route ends from the bus, the sun and the alcohol level concerns there. Um, gloves will be available for everybody that every every route will have the gloves on the bus. They're latex free gloves and they're there in case we have an incident where we have to go back and help a child that's been sick or something like that. It protects the driver and the uh, monitor from that situation. Also the gloves will be utilized later during cleaning. It'll be a, a stipulation for cleaning. Um, The bus cleaning, okay, that's the big topic on how we're going to get that done. We've got a good plan in place, I think. It's, um, we're going to do our general cleaning between our regular protocol, daily sweeping, cleaning of the bus, after the, the runs, okay, and again after the PM runs. That's going to include your regular sweep and mop, you know, whatever needs to be done. And then we're going to go through the buses and sanitize them. We have some backpack sprayers, and it's going to uh, put the approved cleaner that we're using, and it's going to distribute that for the wide area from top to bottom. It's going to miss the entire area of the bus that would be need to be cleaned. Did you say that would be done twice a day? Yes, sir. Okay. Just I may have missed this when you said it. So, what times would that be done? After the morning runs, after the okay. morning routes. It will we'll go through and sanitize the bus like that, and then again at the end of the, day. End of the day. Yes, okay. sir. All right. Thank you. And then, additionally, on Wednesday, the, we're referring to that as deep cleaning, and we're planning on going through the buses, each bus, very thoroughly with the same process and the uh, backpack sprayers. And for our home buses, they're going to be supplied with hand sprayers to clean those buses at home. Uh, then uh, additionally, the buses will be deep cleaned on the days that the bus is due for its regular monthly inspection. So, uh, the routes, I touched base on that earlier. They're, they're going to run on, you know, we're planning the AB, looking at that and those options now. And uh, they'll remain the same for consistency and we'll pick up the A students on the, those appropriate days and the B on those appropriate days. Questions for Grady? Thanks, Grady. Thank, Thank you very Grady. much, Grady. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. I think we've got Mr. Shutt here next to speak to us. We developed the custodial procedures document. And what is in this document, we went, I went to the CDC website and tried to get best practices and things that they recommend. Um, we're put, we put this book up together so we can give to the custodians. And actually, I'll jump down to the last bullet here. We had some training yesterday, and we went through this document and uh, got some feedback and some suggestions. And I will say, uh, our custodians are can-do people. And I'm very, very impressed by them. They're not intimidated by this, and they're just ready to get it done. Um, so getting back to our document, we come up with a, a, a recommended list of PDE. Uh, We've developed some custodial checklists for both day and night custodian cleaning, and this is more of a accountability tool. And what that uh, incorporates is a just a spreadsheet checklist of what area you clean and what you did for the whole week. And everybody understands why we're doing that. It's to keep them on task, and it's also to be able to pull that thing back up if something ever happens. Um, we put in that. Uh, document also some procedures uh, suggested by the CDC if we have an area where a student or a faculty member is suspected of having COVID-19 uh, and there's some special uh, recommendations for that. Uh, we went over those yesterday and then we also put in there a list of currently approved, uh, approved cleaning chemicals and as we talked in the administrators meeting yesterday uh, we're still looking for new chemicals. Uh, and we won't quit looking for them. We thought we were on a track to find one for a 45 second kill time. There's some bad publicity about it. Uh, we sent in some, want some clarifying information on that to make sure it's safe. But everybody bombards you with this stuff and 
everybody else's is bad for you and ours is the best and perfect. So we're working through those one at a time and not uh, and not overlooking any of them right now. I, say, I wish I had a dollar for every PPE email that I've received because I would oh, be goodness. Uh, a wealthy man. And companies that never had anything to do with PPE yes. uh, are PPE experts now. Well, and one, one thing I want to mention uh, on that, David, it, it came up in our principal's meeting is the idea is we're, we're trying to desanitize. You think of a high school where I've got different sets of kids that may be coming you know, into a classroom. There's a need to to desanitize and do that quickly. You know, uh, we don't have 10 minutes in between classes to do it. Uh, that's why we were attracted to. I was wondering, I, I hadn't had a chance to check back with you to see what you had learned, but the quicker that time period is, uh, it, it enables us to keep, keep moving within the confines of the school day. We don't want to waste time. Uh, time's very valuable to us. Thank you. And, and, and we're still vetting those out, all these chemicals we are looking at. Ten minutes is the time for the chemical. We Two chemicals we've currently adopted and we've been using since the norovirus outbreak of a couple years ago. So we were kind of in a good spot chemical-wise already uh, with the equipment we had and the chemical we had already settled on. Um, we're always looking for new equipment. Uh, one of the things we brought up yesterday as well was uh, buying $13 pump-up sprayers, and we're going to equip all the night custodial staffs with these sprayers. Um, they seem to really adapt to that. We looked at them yesterday. Um, you got guys coming in trying to sell you the $1,000 ones. I had somebody call me from Florida and said they saw us on YouTube where we done a news uh, report here about two years ago, and she said, I'd like to get a testimonial from you to sell these. And I said, well, you probably don't want them to talk to me. <laughs> they work great, and I'm glad we got them. But I said, we're, we're experimenting. And just like uh, Grady and the guys in Downey have done it to bus drives, you know, we're not going to spend $1,000 or something if we can get it for 13 bucks. Thank you. I mean, you know, just makes sense. <laughs> and, and then uh, the other thing we've been looking at is, and working with our mechanical engineers, is how to set up our HVAC systems. And there's been a lot of publicity about that. Uh, there's an organization called ASHRAE, which is made up of environmental and mechanical engineers that deal with HVAC systems. Uh, some of the recommendations, recommendations they made, we can't do. Uh, we can't put HEPA filters in our systems because they weren't designed, the fans aren't strong enough. They'll freeze our units up. Uh, some of the, one of the things we are looking at is outside air or makeup air, opening up to 100% and letting it run wide open. That comes with some negatives that we got to overcome. It brings a lot of humidity into the building, brings a lot of heat in the building uh, this time of the year. And one of the things that they have suggested, and I've read some efficacy on this, and I, I believe this for sure, if you can keep the humidity in your spaces between 40 and 60 percent, 24 hours the virus is going to be dead. So we're lucky in the fact that we have humidity control in 80% of our buildings. So I can monitor the humidity, uh, but when you've got bodies in the building and kids heating that space up and you're cooling it off, humidity is not a problem for us right now. Uh, I'm more interested to see, because I've never paid attention to it in the winter, because of course, but we don't have gas heat hardly anywhere, so I'm not worried about drying the air out. So I think we're in good shape with the humidity, uh, but we'll monitor that. I'll set up some trends on each building that we can monitor it on. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we had a lunch and learn yesterday that went really well. Uh, I want to I keep patting the custodians on the back that they don't get enough praise. Uh, what a great group of people, uh, great ideas. It's all positive, all positive energy from them. Uh, they're, they, I gave them the document. They're going to look it over and offer suggestions of what they feel like they can and maybe go above and beyond what we've even asked for. So I'm still getting feedback on that, and we'll adjust this document and maybe adjust it right up until we get ready to start school. Um, but we're we're going to refine it and make it as good as we can to keep those. They do a good job keeping the schools clean. I mean, I think anybody that goes into our schools not, will recognize that. Um, so I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm enthused on that front. Any questions? It's, it's strange talking to people with the mask on, and I can't see your faces, so it's it's hard to know who may have and may not have a question. So if I'm, yeah. 
If I miss something, I apologize. No, no, I, 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 I just would comment on uh, one of the things David and I talked about early on was trying to get a standardized uh, routine, particularly with this, uh, because it gives us that expectation. And he's done a great job of putting that together, getting input from his custodians on, on how to best do that. So that hats off to you for that work. And, uh, Appreciate it. I'm just plagiarizing good ideas. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Don't reinvent the wheel. Yeah, all that's legal, isn't it, Mr. Land? Thank you so much, David. Yeah, thank you, David. Oh, well, the work you do and, and all the people that work with you. And I'll pass it on. I appreciate it. Thank you. You may find it hard to believe, but I'm going to be brief. Um, fortunately, I'm not dealing with the day-to-day -day in the school. I just have to figure out how to pay for all of this. Uh, we have warned our schools that there if we receive a um, district cut to our seek funding their funding will be cut as well um, also cautioned on fundraisers uh, we're gonna hopefully not be selling chocolate bars this year unless things improve um, and then uh, we um, part of my department is the purchasing department and Derek Payne has done an outstanding job of getting us the pp and &E that we need to even make uh, this possible at all. We have over a million masks ready to go for all of our students, visitors, staff. Uh, we're going to have hand sanitizers in our hand sanitizer in every room, every classroom, and in the office area. Um, he's gotten thermometers, um, the KN95 mask. He's done a great job. He's worked with Wendy and David Shutt to make sure we have the chemicals that we need and the equipment Wendy needs. Um, so, are there any questions for me? Is there any way to know the cost that all of this uh, is going to cost us, all the changes and all the extra? Um, yeah. Uh, well, you know, we have spent a significant amount of money. Um, we have received Federal uh, CARES Act money to pay for part of that, and we do believe that we will get um, some money from FEMA to address this uh, since it has been declared a national disaster. So we have gotten some government funding? Yes, yes. So far, we have been fortunate that um, we have gotten the money that we needed to pay for what we've what we've had to do so far. So that's not out of our budget, not anything extra. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. We know we're going to run into some of those things. I mean, you've kind of heard from Wendy, and it's been going along. There's going to be some of that that we're going to, and that's the problem. Is because of the situation, it causes causes us increased cost at a time when we're expecting. Uh, decreased revenues. It's kind of a lopsided uh, deal with that financially. But to, to operate, it's, it's going to cost us more money. We know, we know that's the case. Thank Appreciate you. ideas like uh, Mr. Shutt looking at a thousand dollars per year versus thirteen dollars per year. So yeah. those kinds of things help us out immensely. I was going to be brief, but then I got an extra area added to me to <laughs> today, so that might be a little longer than anticipated. <laughs> Uh, you've heard a little bit from student services already with the health coordinator and with transportation. Um, and the work the task force has done has been all teaching and learning, all departments with operations. It's, it's been absolutely a, a team effort, and we have a good team. And I really appreciate what they all do and appreciate what you all do. Uh, the reopening plan that you have in front of you, it does meet all KDE and KRS requirements for school calendars. That's always a question that we have to look at is, does it meet the requirements that we've been given for school calendar in a school year? This year, um, districts are allowed to have unlimited NTI days for the 2021 school year. Normally, by statute, you're limited to 10. Last year, the, we got a waiver on it through uh, Senate Bill 177, and the governor has also issued, already issued an executive order giving us unlimited for the the school year we're about to enter. So that's always good information. Um, KDE this year will track student participation for the school year more so than the average daily attendance. Um, that's because so many districts are doing virtual academies and looking at AB plans and just school looks different so things will be tracked different for lack of a better explanation to that. Uh, each day we have we will be able to count as 400 instructional minutes. That includes the days we have the students in person that includes the days that we have have NTI or the digital learning the digital learning days on Wednesday or if we have to go full NTI they would all count as 400 instructional minutes so we still have the requirement of the 1062 hours um, 
but our start date and end date could still be the same, barring we don't have a snowstorm or ice storm, and well, that's all we need next, isn't it? Um, the, but all instructional delivery formats would count towards those minutes and those hours. Uh, KDE is actually with Infinite Campus. There's a new tool going to be pushed out to us through Infinite Campus that will help us manage that a lot easier than, than the way it's set up now. And it's designed for blended learning. It's designed for the A-B schedules. It's designed for the virtual academies. And it's also designed where if we're able to have in-person class, if we had to shift to NTI. So there's a lot of things that are built for us now that were not last year. So that's good news as far as logistics of uh, keeping up with the minutes and hours for instruction time. One of the big concerns we all have, and we had it last year when we had to go to NTI. I remember standing here in front of you talking about NTI and teaching and learning built NTI in three days. Um, we were talking and you know, three days later, Jan and Beth's team had it built. Well, we've had more time to really hone in on that, learn from last year and, and make it better. Um, any type of digital instruction. But one of the concerns is mental health with our students. Last year, our, our student assistance coordinators who are our licensed mental health professionals, they continued to meet with the students. They did it through Google Meeting. They did it with phones. They did it any way they could to still meet with the students on their caseload uh, and picked up some extra students. You know, being at home was, for some students, a little anxiety. Um, my children would probably tell you that too. They had to be with me more. Uh, but, all, but the thing about it is this school year, whether a student is in the virtual academy, whether they're coming to school in person, they're still going to have access to those services. The student assistance coordinators will still manage those caseloads. They'll still be able to work with those families, meet with those students, whether it be in person or through a digital platform. Also the same as with family resource centers. So even though a child may elect virtual, or the parent may elect virtual, or we may be A, B rotating, we're still going to be providing services for our students. Uh, just because you're not physically with us doesn't mean you're, not, doesn't mean you're, you're absent from us. We still want to be able to have that contact and to provide that support to the families. Um, next slide is a little video that will show you a little bit about what we're kind of what school could look like. We're not entirely clear just how transmissible, especially young kids are. We know they're less likely to get sick, but how likely are they to contribute to the spread? We also know for sure the schools are going to have to do everything they can to try and keep kids safe. Can you talk about a lot different when you get to school? Now, if there's anything we know about this virus, it's that it doesn't like masks, so those are going to be required in all schools, and it doesn't like distance. So you see here how the desks and the teachers area all six feet apart. I'm well aware that a lot of school districts can't possibly do this. All the desks facing the same direction. If there's any virus in the area, you want to go in one direction as opposed to mixing. Also, there's this idea of cohort. That means that the same students would be together all day long less spread, less mixing that way, and also if someone who does get sick, it's easier to contact trace. Another thing schools are going to have to think about, trying to reduce areas where children will congregate. Uh, think about the staggered start times, for example, rotating classrooms, one-way hallways, and possibly even getting rid of common locker areas. And another thing schools might start doing is having outdoor classrooms, or at least opening the windows to improve the ventilation in indoor classrooms. At the end of the day, every family is going to have to look at the risks and the rewards of sending their kids back to school. Also, pay attention to what's happening in your community. Is the virus increasing or is it decreasing? That needs to be a factor in your decision. And finally, use the rest of the summer to get your kids used to wearing masks, which they're going to have to do, and of course, washing their hands as much as possible. So a lot of what you saw in the video is, is what we were given in from KDE with guidelines or requirements to have in-person school and also straight from the Center for Disease Control, those, those match up. So I thought his video did a really good job of just kind of showing that the desk setting apart and, and the social distancing. Uh, today there was a town hall meeting with KDE, the Department of Public Health was involved, I was able to listen to part of that, Dr. Stack, who, who we all feel like is a family member now, I think because we've seen him so much, was on there. And just some of the things uh, that he said you know, they recommend the six feet apart of students on the spacing would be uh, a radius, you know, all the way around the students, six feet apart. And one of the questions he received was, you know, if the classrooms are fully loaded with students, uh, 
what would that mean? You know, he talked about seating charts, but his quote was, "Those three feet apart for students is a substantial risk for transmission, even with a mask." So his the re recommendation is to be able to do the six feet apart. Um, the mask is part of it, but it's not the only thing that we can rely on. And that is from from Dr. Stack, who is commissioner of the Department for Public Health and emergency room physician. You may click or you click in back there. Okay. Um, the next part that I've been asked to talk about, these were prepared by Dr. Shutt. She wasn't able to be with us tonight. It's uh, more of the human resources side of the equation. Um, so all staffing changes will be based on student enrollment numbers. When we get the numbers back of the number of students who want to or will be in the virtual academy, then her department will kick in and start looking at staffing and how we need to staff that and, how, and what teachers we need to shift around. Uh, the staff will be able to apply to be a virtual learning teacher. So there's a form they've developed. The staff members can fill out and say, this is something I would like to do. Uh, of course, part of that will be looked at with certifications and areas of need and, and other factors would go into who would actually be assigned. But the staff will be able to express their interest in being a virtual learning teacher. Um, staff from existing schools could be moved based on student population, uh, how many students elect virtual academy at, at one school could be different than, than another. Uh, one of the plans was to, is to assign an administrator, uh, reassign an administrator uh, to be the lead for the virtual academy at least for one year uh, because there will be some management with that. Uh, when I was principal, uh, we had a virtual school and it, it does take a lot of work to do that. So it would be very important to have someone who could oversee and help manage that, part, that piece. Um, all staff will be required to wear the appropriate PPE. I know Wendy Cozell has been working with the health department on what that is for each job description and, and what that would need to be for each staff member. Um, and that would be required while at work. Just going to let you down with this. Um, so as far as leave options, that's been a big question um, because there were some changes Last year that came out from the federal government, there's been some stuff, uh, actually this week, I think the lieutenant governor has signed off on some things too, so that's changed within about the last 48 hours, uh, which has been common with a lot of this. Um, so they still have, staff still has their traditional leave, 10 sick days, two personal days, and three emergency days. And they, of course, they still, Family Medical Leave Act is still in place. Um, it's available for 12 weeks during a 12 month period to staff members. Uh, so there's multiple avenues to address needs for COVID uh, positive or quarantine situations. Now under the federal coronavirus relief uh, act, it allowed the 10 days for quarantine. They, so basically what would happen if a, if a staff member was, Mr. Robbins jump in if I misspeak, if a staff member was have to quarantine for 10 days, there would be days available to them where they don't have to use their sick days that they have already earned. That is going to be given by the state and also it's through the federal government also. Because it is possible we could have a staff member have to do that multiple times in a year. I mean, it could very well happen. So at least they wouldn't have to use their personal sick days that they have acquired and earned. So Damon, that is, that is a federal guideline? In other words, it's not up to a local board to make that decision, right? Yeah, that's not up to a local board at this time, the way I understand it. And like I said, the Lieutenant Governor has signed off on some things earlier this week in reference well, to that. Yesterday there was some confusion on that, so I just want to make sure that. Our, our general philosophy, just when it comes to staff, is first of all, I mean, in, in terms of a COVID positive mm -hmm. test, but then also quarantine is uh, the employer in that case is requiring that individual to vacate their, you know, the building status, the in-person status. It could be possible that they're asymptomatic. They don't, you know, they're not sick, and uh, that employee could work uh, virtually, you know, uh, in a non-in-person environment. So we would seek that, you know, as a first choice. Uh, but if neither of those two options are available, the uh, general philosophy that I have instilled is that I don't want to see an employee use any of their personal leave because we, as the employer, have basically made a decision that we, we do not want you in the workplace. That's sort of the general philosophy behind that. So an example that she has illustrated that we have a teacher, Ms. Miller, an in-person teacher at an elementary school, maybe a husband or spouse works in another profession and 
maybe the spouse tests positive and now our teacher is required by the physician to quarantine for 14 days because there's been a contact. Under the federal relief fund allows for 10, the 10 paid sick days and she would not have to use uh, any of her personal sick days to cover that quarantine time. So it could be that we have teachers impacted by outside of school situations, a spouse or someone in the household that they would have to quarantine. Um, and the other thing, a couple of things I made notes of I didn't have in the slide, but so we've all learned more about viruses and COVID and coronaviruses over the last few months than we ever dreamed we would have to. But one of the CDC recommendations on school planning and, and transitioning um, back and forth, and one of the things this plan calls for is being able to transition, you know, we've got the green and red and yellow. It talks about, what we talked about is looking at your local numbers and your state numbers. If you can see a 14 day decline in that, then maybe that's time when you could make a change. But that is a CDC recommendation, a 14 consecutive day decline. Uh, also the AV model, when the students are split, uh, I know Janet Beth talked about a little bit, they will, Infinite Campus will split them for us. There's some work we have to do in advance of that, but it, they will split them by household. So students who live in the same household would be on the same rotation. We wouldn't have an older sibling going to school one day and a younger sibling in the other rotation. They would be split by their primary household. So all the children who live in the household would be on the A rotation, or all the children of the household could be on the B rotation. Uh, that way we're not splitting families up and making it more difficult. Um, the other thing, if we are not able to social distance, you know, masks are required for students. Uh, I asked Grady earlier about elementary students, so I think that, that could be a challenge. Uh, we all take them off when we can. But if we're not able to social distance, then masks would have to stay on the students, even in the classroom. So we could potentially have an elementary student who for an eight hour period, the only time they'd be able to take the mask off is when they consume their lunch. For me, that would be a challenge. Uh, I don't know for them, but for me it would. And, you know, just, I guess based on, again, our numbers, they, they may change, but most likely when we go to a green schedule, that's going to require full masking, you know, in the classroom as well as the hallways. What we're able to do on the start here by the recommendation is masking in the large common areas demasking when it comes to the classroom, but that will that would be a significant change from going to yellow light to green light. I think that's my last slide. Any questions from any of the board members? Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we've got uh, three other uh, individuals to close this out that I'd like for you to hear from. Uh, Dr. Murphy uh, is next, and Dr. Murphy served on our task force as a principal of Whitesville Elementary School. So I asked her from her hat and her position as well as the task force to try to speak to you and give you a perspective that we otherwise may not have obtained here this evening. Thank Dr. Murphy. Hello, how are you all tonight? Good. 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 Thanks for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I know that um, you are hearing a lot of this um, and probably feeling the same that we all have as the task force over the last several weeks and um, your mind is probably very full. I will say that in serving on the task force, um, you know, my heart as an educator at our first meeting was we want to be back. And I have sat week after week and listened and my head as a realist is starting to go, Mm, how is this going to work? And so um, I just think in talking with fellow administrators and what everyone feels at this point, um, I get the same response. We want to go back, but, and there's that but of safety and concerns about, you know, mental health and is this going to be traumatic in some experiences when we bring them back? What are the repercussions if we come back for two weeks and then we shut down? And, you know, kids have waited a long time to get back in school. And so what is that breakaway point going to be when that elementary students and that type of thing? And, you know, when I listen to things about PPE for our health techs, you know, Miss um, Alice is someone that they know their face, that they know her face at White Hill Elementary. She comforts them and, you know, thinking of um, what that will feel like is just going to be an adjustment period. I think administrators are concerned about timelines and that type of thing. And I think um, 
Mr. Mason, who also serves on the task force, said something that kind of resonated with me, and that, like, think big, but start small. And so um, that's why I believe, you know, on behalf of all of the administrators, we're feeling like this rotation option kind of is the best of both worlds for us. It gives us that interaction with students that our teachers and our staff so desperately want and we know our students need, but it also allows us to start small and really run these things and see how they go um, and then hopefully, you know, get to that green light before long. So, are there questions that you have? Um, yes, Tricia, um, Jen and Beth mentioned this while ago about uh, kindergarten through second grade, face-to-face -face interaction for reading is real important. One thing I've heard from a lot of parents that they're real nervous about sending their kids back, especially the younger kids, that they feel like they're, they're behind. So with, with this model that you're, we're thinking about going to, how, how do you address that? In other words, like when kids come back, and I know like in reading and math, they, they probably are a lot may be behind. So how, how would that be addressed to this, this, this model? Well, I think that we're all trying to find silver linings in what we're faced with. And one of the things that um, we keep looking at is, you know, typically our classrooms have 24, you know, 25 students. And when you take that number and you split that in half, you know, our teachers are just thinking about how far they might be able to get in two days of instruction. And, you know, we always dream of that small group and being able to manage that. And so I think um, <coughs> one of the things we will do is, the, you know, take, take the big overarching things from the curriculum and look at this is the standard that we need to get to and then be able to really drill down. Um, I know Janabeth probably talked with you about that Wednesday and just being able to individually, although it may be virtually on those Wednesdays, just being able to individually conference. Um, I think it's a mix of, you know, support outside of school with that virtual piece, but also being able to use that small group um, but for those two days and really try to conquer as much as we can in those two days. Um, you know, I just think we're thinking um, in terms of just full curriculum of reading and math on those two days and really pushing that um, and supporting students and filling those gaps. Um, I, think, I think, you know, the, the plan from teaching and learning will help us really cover that. Thank you. Thank you for serving on the task force. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Dr. Murphy? Okay, Miss Murphy. So let's give her a hand for being the twenty-four uh, teacher of the year. So uh, we wish you the best in the fall. We'll be up there to be with you, God willing, and, and able to do it. So thank you. Um, so I don't want to repeat everything that Dr. Murphy said because a lot of it is you know very similar. But one of the things um, I keep thinking about when we talk about a hybrid model or, or the AB is um, the potential for all of us as educators, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of other teachers, to truly reevaluate um, what is the biggest and most important pieces for that in-person interaction time. And so for me as a teacher, one of the biggest benefits of seeing my students, of course, in person, besides just that relationship piece, um, is being able to change the way that we may have always done everything. You know, you've heard somebody say, Maybe you've heard this, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. So really what I see this is is an opportunity to uh, reevaluate everything we've ever done. And so from a teacher perspective, how might that look um, that those two days that I have that student in person is um, guided, you know, you're working with the students more individually. It'll be a lot smaller room, so that's a big benefit. I know the teacher ratio, um, it makes a huge difference if you look at um, at you know what the product and then of course that asynchronous Wednesday being able to conference students being in the small groups and then when they're learning virtual you know those two virtual days that independent time um, from my perspective is actually a positive because um, if we've used our time wisely which I know we will in person in the classroom what an amazing opportunity to be able to see okay what can they do um, now that they're you know you have to say on your own but without that 
guiding. And um, really the learning cycle lends itself to that, that there's a teacher that is direct teaching, and then there's eventually a student with less and less uh, coaching, if you will. So it's really a positive um, it, as far as, she says, silver lining, I totally agree, if we can't be in school um, in a traditional manner five days a week. So um, for me personally, you know, both as a mom, a teacher, you know, and all of that, um, I totally agree that it's the best of both worlds, you know, because we want to keep our students and staff safe, period. And then after that, we want to keep relationships. So. Anybody have any questions? That's a positive attitude you have. It's why you are a finalist and teacher of the year. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yes. Hey, I'm excited. Thank you very much. I said I always wanted a challenge, and I'm like, what better year? What better chance? I'm serious. I mean, we could be looking at a pendulum swing in education in general for the future. So I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, I'd like for you to hear from uh, Mr. Ferguson. And as he's, he's coming up, uh, I mean, the guy that's in the newspaper and yeah, that okay. guy. You know, sometimes I hear I hear some people that will say, you know, I've, I've not known anybody that's that's, that's tested. Now, it's starting to change a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's tested positive for this virus. But Mr. Ferguson had it early on. Uh, and I distinctly remember uh, talking with him. He was headed to the hospital. Um, he was, I was there. I don't remember the conversation, but yeah, I was there. He was very sick, and uh, I remember our conversation, and I remember. He and I said, well, do you mind if I say a prayer with you? And uh, we said a prayer over the phone, uh, and he was at the hospital, and I did believe in the power of prayer, and uh, he got released. He did not stay in the hospital, got to go home, and uh, but he still had difficulty. So I want him to tell his story here tonight. That's his purpose of being here. He's one of us. He lives among us. You need to hear what he's got to say. So, Mr. Ferguson. Well, I hope you're not expecting what came out Tuesday because I didn't, <laughs> didn't uh, have that you did, down. you did well. Tell your story. So I'm just going to kind of tell you my story and kind of go from the beginning. And I had to start mainly with the uh, Saturday, March 21st. It's the day they say I was officially uh, sick with the COVID. And that too, everyone was around me on Saturday. had to quarantine. And had to start the day out. Got up in the morning and normally my routine is to get up and weigh and then I'm going to go run or exercise. So I got up and weighed and just to be honest with you, I told the administrators between 253 and 255 is 253.8, uh, which is way too much, I know, but uh, got up and got on the treadmill and ran. Uh, did about, I think it did about five miles in 60 minutes, which is great. That's what my goal was and I did it. Then my wife had some chores for me. She wanted me to go mow my mother-in-law's yard and our yard. So I mowed and we did the yards with her. And I felt pretty good. Can't say that I was telling you that I felt bad or felt sick. I was a little bit tired. And then we had our family get together that night and all my daughters were there. My son-in-law was there and my future son-in-law was there. And we just kind of watched a movie and kind of spent some time together. And my granddaughter was there. And I told Lance, you know, I'm getting a little bit tired. Of, I think it just did too much, had a sinus infection. I get an annual sinus infection. So I got up next morning on Sunday, and of course everything was pretty much shut down. It was COVID. And sat there and we watched a movie in the morning and then told Lynn and said, I don't think I'm gonna run this morning. I just don't feel real good and kind of got chills. And about 30 minutes later I said, you know, I think we just need to take my temperature. I just don't feel good. So I took my temperature and I don't remember what it was, but I had a little bit of a temperature and I thought, well, I'm going to be a model. I need to make sure I tell my staff I'm not going to be there Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday because I got a temperature. So I emailed my staff, told them I wouldn't be there. I was going to self quarantine because I had a fever. It wasn't much of a fever and got up Monday, didn't have a fever. That's good. I'm doing good. It's just a sinus infection. Of course, I think um, I wasn't paranoid about being sick at that time. Then got up Tuesday, didn't have fever. I thought I'll be back at work on Thursday. This is good. Just a sinus infection. Got up Wednesday and I guess that's when it really started hitting me. I uh, uh, this doesn't feel good, it doesn't feel right. So my temperature and I had a temperature and it kind of kept going up for the next two or three days. Uh, the big culminating, in fact, talked to the doctor. I was only showing one real symptom and that was uh, the temperature. My cough wasn't real bad. It was just sporadic, maybe once every hour or something. But just the fever. So if you remember back at that time, they didn't have enough test kit so if you didn't have more than one symptom they were they were not going to test you so Friday night 
Uh, got up, had to go to the bathroom the other night. So get older, most of us guys didn't realize that. So got up, went to the bathroom. I didn't make it back to the bed. Uh, just, I passed out, lost consciousness. I don't know exactly what happened. Called the ambulance, went to the hospital. And while we were there, they said I was showing enough symptoms because I had the pneumonia, had the fever, and it was a pretty good fever. Uh, so they said, we're going to go ahead and test you for the flu, just see if that's what it is. Now well, the flu came back negative. So, well, we're going to test you for the virus, the uh, coronavirus. And I was kind of still thinking, it's not me. I've had a really good immune system. I've been a principal for 22 years. I don't have this. You know, I haven't had the flu. And they said, your immune system is pretty good, and they compared it to the flu. I don't have this. So they tested me. Didn't get the test results back until Tuesday. I think it was Tuesday when I went in. And uh, I can tell you, starting on Sunday, the fever started very consistently. In the morning, it was about 99 to 100. Uh, about 2 o'clock, it was probably about 101, 102. By 6, 7 o'clock, or 8 o'clock at night, it was 103, 104 consistently. And on Tuesday, I got the call, and they said uh, the test back came back positive. And I had to do a teleconference. And so I did the telecheck. And I'm talking to the lady doctor, and we're going back and forth. And I tell her, I said, you know, I, I think I'm doing okay. Now, while we're talking, I'm sitting in my bedroom quarantined, and I'm having to put my hand on my bed to get a breath and stretch my chest out. And then about five minutes later, I have to do the same thing in the chest. you got to breathe because breathing was difficult, uh, but it had been difficult pretty much from the time I started getting sick. And I was having to take those breaths and get, and I just, accum I just attributed it to being having pneumonia because uh, I'd never had pneumonia before. I just thought that's what it was. And she said, you're not breathing very well. You're going to have to come in. I'm like, I've been breathing like this for a week. Why do I need to come in? She said, this virus attacks your respiratory system. You're going to have to come in. So loaded up. Got, didn't have to take a whole lot of clothes. Uh, just kind of got loaded up, took a doom bag in, and went to the emergency room, and sat there for about, I didn't sit there, but I was in there for about six hours. And the second doctor, the emergency room doctor, came in, and he goes, well, we did your chest x-rays and your pneumonia, pneumonia x-rays. And the good news is your pneumonia's not getting any worse. It may be a little bit better. He said, the original notes on here said something about going ahead and admitting you you were a candidate for a ventilator. He said, you're not a candidate for a ventilator. You're going to go home. This is not the right place for you. So, sounds great to me. So I went home, continued with the high fevers uh, for a couple more days. If you want to know the exact days, you probably have to talk to Lynn. I don't remember a lot about when I was sick. A lot of this comes back from, it's from Lynn and from notes, because uh, we had to take notes of temperatures all throughout the days. We had a full notepad of that. But uh, I can tell you it was difficult to eat. Uh, you know, during those days, I know it sounds bad and it's a little bit gross, but just getting up and taking a shower, that was a chore. Uh, if I got in the shower, had the shower door, and I was usually leaning, about halfway through the shower, I was leaning on the shower door trying to breathe and just telling Lynn, I'm not going to make it, i got to get out of here. So, you know, get your shower, we'll get out of here in a minute. But to kind of end the story, because it kept going like that, and it's, the same thing repetitive day over day. Eating was a chore. It me about an hour to eat my breakfast. It me about an hour to eat my lunch and supper. And usually I didn't want to eat supper. Um, but going on to when I got released, uh, April 17th, I just got released a couple of days before my birthday. I was still losing weight. Remember, I started at about 253.8. On April 17th, when I, on my birthday, I weighed about 227, 225. I don't remember exact. And I wasn't finished losing weight. I kept losing weight and got down to about 222, but I was over the virus and just incredibly weak. If I went out and walked, because the doctor told me I had to start walking when I got released with the mask on, if I walked for five minutes, well, that was a miracle. So in my neighborhood, my first goal was to walk three houses down and come back and then go back in. I'd do that, go back in, sit down, and just had no energy. Uh, a couple of days after that, I think this is the part. It may hit home for some people. I uh, sat down on, sat on the side of my bed, and Lynn came in there, and she just looked at me, and she said, what's wrong? I'm like, sweetheart, I'm just going to be honest with you. I didn't think I was going to make it. So I didn't think I was going to see my granddaughter grow up. I didn't think I, think I was going to see my two youngest daughters get married. So for the first time in my life, I don't mean to ever felt superhuman, but I feel like I was 
human and I was not going to make it. And I was, thought, I was thinking about all the things I was going to miss. I said, and the bad part is, I know there are people out there that get this and they're asymptomatic. And for me as an administrator, and this is what I told our administrators on Tuesday, my concern's not for all those asymptomatic people. You know, that's great. If everybody got this was asymptomatic, we wouldn't be worrying about it. But it's the people that get hit severely like I did or like uh, the gentleman in the paper, Terry Anderson. You know, his whole family's got COVID, but he's the only one having severe symptoms. Uh, that's the people I worry about. And as an administrator, when we come back, and I'm glad we're coming back, I'm still nervous about it. Uh, I've mentioned that, made that clear a couple of times, but I'm still nervous about it. My concern is if we have a child that gets sick and no, ch no child has really passed away, or we're going to second guess ourselves as administrators, what could I have done differently? Uh, and just Mr. Robbins and all of the administrators, you know, if one of the administrators or one of the teachers gets sick, we're going to think, what could we have done differently with this? Why? What should we have done? How could we have prevented this? Um, I just know for those who, I have people in my family that still talk about wanting to go out, wanting to do things, wanting to go places. Uh, this is very real. I mean, the good news is it seems like there's more people that get it with asymptomatic, that are asymptomatic. But the ones we have to worry about are the ones who get the severe symptoms. And uh, and I guess, I guess big, I have I don't know what else to say. Are there any questions or anything about the experience? Or I have any questions? We're glad you're here. Yeah, I am too. I had I had seen a follow-up question the other day. Is what what do you how do you feel now? Do you have any repercussions? You know from that so. I would think that may be something they'd be interested in knowing. Uh, I do physically feel like I'm 100% back to where I was. I can't run five miles in an hour right now, but my wife is my trainer and she's making me get up at five o'clock in the morning to go exercise. So I'm doing that regularly with her, which is a good thing. Uh, my struggle is mentally. Uh, going through all the trauma training the last couple of years has been a good thing for me because this was a traumatic experience. Uh, Tuesday was the first time I've really shared my story and talked about the severe symptoms that I had, which were, which was mainly the temperature and the fatigue, and uh, that was the first time. And I will tell you, since then I've been a little bit paranoid. I've got a, still got sinus drainage and all that, so I still wake up and I noticed it this morning when I woke up. I was like, I know the sinus drainage. <laughs> Am I getting sick again? But that's the thing that keeps coming back. It's a mental thing for me. It's not physical. It's, it's mental. I've talked to a couple of other people that have had severe symptoms, and they don't know if they had COVID or not, but they think they did. It's one is our school nurse. She and I talk about it every once in a while. And she's physically over this, but she thinks, you know, she still has that mental aspect. It's a traumatic experience, I and mean, there's little triggers. I don't like looking at Black Forest Ham. The joke there was, uh, my wife gave it to me one one evening or one day for lunch, and if you've heard about it, it does change your taste buds. Either you have none, or it changes taste of all the food you eat, and I would have swore to you she was trying to kill me with some, <laughs> some old meat that was rancid, and we were yelling, they were like, we are, you're trying to kill me? What is, what is this? And it was stuff I was eating every day, I'd eaten a lot, but it's uh, physically, and it, but I will tell you, it took, if you have the severe symptoms, uh, it took me probably until about a month ago or within the last month to get physically over over everything, to start getting my strength back and be able to, to do the things I did. Mentally, it's going to take a little bit longer. How are you with the A-B schedule that we've been hearing about all evening? I'm more comfortable with the A-B schedule than I was trying to bring all the kids back at one time. And I'm still nervous about bringing them back, uh, and I, but that's the mental part of me. I know what, uh, Matt Mason asked me that same thing, and I just told him, same thing I'll tell you. I'm going to do what's best for the kids and for our staff. And I think seeing another person is, if we can do it and do it safely, is the best thing to do. Uh, doing that is the AB schedule mm -hmm. for social distancing Cause, and safety. Because no way with the five-day schedule right now, if we brought all the kids back, they'd be wearing masks all day. And, of course, I don't read a whole lot, but I read a few things. They say wearing a mask all day is not really healthy for you either. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also know I've talked to David Shutt and, Probably need to keep a mouth shut every once in a while, but ventilation in school, ventilation systems, is, they're not the best. Uh, and if we're sitting in there with 820 kids and 100 staff members at Burns Middle School, uh, it's it's not when, and it's not going to be if, 
it's going to be when are we going to shut down because we're going to have somebody get sick. I think we have a chance with the smaller, smaller classes where kids can go into a classroom. If they're comfortable, they can keep the mask on. If we're socially distanced and they need to, they can take the mask off and so can teachers. Daniel, we really appreciate you coming and sharing sharing a personal, very personal story that uh, I, I can tell has still bothers you. And uh, so we we're thankful that you're uh, recovered and wish you the very best and thank thank you for sharing your story. Thank you all and thank good luck with your decision. I know it's an important one for all of us. Thank take care of yourself. Yeah, thank you. They weren't take care care you early like and, and because they didn't have the means to test that much and that you it was so long before you were diagnosed. Did that make your make it longer drawn out for you or did they ever talk about that? They don't know. There's so much they don't know about this. I would tell you it uh, originally I was on medicine just for pneumonia which from what I understand, I could be wrong, the pneumonia medicine has no effect on the coronavirus. That's a completely different issue. So finally, once I tested power, uh, positive, they gave me a different medicine too, actually very strong. Uh, but until then, you were, you know, I'd say you, it was continuing to get worse because you weren't taking any medicine that was helping right. you. Now, supposedly you develop antibodies after you have it. Uh, you know, have they tested you for that or as far as to the point that what did they say about that? Well, it's funny you mentioned that Miss Jones and I, the nurse, I was talking about talked about that today. She went and got tested, and she comes back with no antibodies. I'm kind of on the borderline. I think about going to get tested every once in a while, and I, I don't want to go get tested because I want to think that I've still I've got some antibodies. And all the reviews I'm reading from the experts at CDC and the World Health Organization is originally about a month ago they said if you had it, you'd have antibodies for about six months. Now they're saying you probably have antibodies for two to three months. I so I haven't really went to get tested because I want to think that I've got those antibodies. You may not be to the point that you're ready to give blood. I gave blood here the other day and they filled out a card. And because they're, they started the 6th of this month and they're going for till early part of August at least where they're, they're giving people a report on antibodies. Uh, I should have told Dr. Bradley to do that. I've been to see him. He takes blood every time I get to go see him. But, uh, I didn't know about it at that time. But. Well, this is at the blood bank. I don't know where, where you have to, if you can go anyplace else, but there. And then your doctor can do it. At the, uh, but they can test and, and find out through your blood if you have the antibodies or not. I've been a catch 22. I haven't done it because the nurses I don't have any antibodies. And well, I still want to think of yeah. them. Hopefully, that's the case after everything that you've been through. I hope that you do it. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank hello. I will do that. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.